When it comes to video gaming history, one thing that each console generation goes through is a transitional period. For starters, when we went from the NES, we were transitioning from 8-bit sprites to 16-bit graphics. And it was from there that the 16-bit console wars was happening with the Super Nintendo and the Sega Genesis. And then we had what was arguably the biggest transition period in gaming, the introduction to 3D. Yep, we were moving on to polygons, and the first 3D gaming console to come out of the gate would be the Sony PlayStation. It became an instant success, as it got people really excited about 3D gaming, with its reveal and its marketing. But there was a lot for many developers to learn about making 3D games, as aside from this being perhaps the biggest transitional period, it's also one of the more experimental. This was something Nintendo would be successful at doing, as Super Mario 64 paved the way for a big 3D environment and camera controls. Developers would follow this model afterwards, but not every game was successful at this, and seeing as how the PlayStation was Sony's first attempt at a game console, they needed some major heavy-hitting franchises on their own. Probably the most major franchise Sony had all throughout the era was Crash Bandicoot, which was developed by Naughty Dog, a company that Sony would own later on. But at the time, Naughty Dog was still a third-party developer that did work with Sony, and the main IP right holders to Crash Bandicoot would be Universal Interactive Studios. So for that, they needed other IPs to carry the PlayStation brand around. Sony needed something from their own first-party studios to become their big IP that they can tout around as their own. Their main studio at the time, which was Sony Interactive Studios America, later renamed to 989 Studios, would develop a few games like Twisted Metal and Jet Moto, as well as certain sports games. And while those are good games in their own right, Sony needed something more than just racing and sports games. They needed their own platformer. And so, in 1998, after a three-year development cycle, Sony released a game that they were betting on becoming a big franchise and voiced by a celebrity. And it's from there that we're treated to the first and last game of Captain Blasto. for the PlayStation 1. The story to this game is that the evil emperor, Boss the Terrible, made a return to the universe after being banished to the fifth dimension. With his legion of aliens, he plans his revenge by utilizing a machine to create a rift in the space-time continuum against the planet Earth. But before they can get to Earth, they must first work on conquering the planet Uranus. Yeah, I think you know where they're going with this. Word of the invasion gets out to Admiral Big Shot, and he alerts Blasto, kicking back in his spaceship, with this rather lovely exchange. Blasto, Uranus is in big trouble. What did I do this time? This is no time for jokes. Blasto accepts the mission he was given to take back the planet Uranus from the invasion of Bosk and his army, and so, the game begins. Now, let's start with the basics. The game has you exploring each of the levels by fighting off a whole horde of aliens that are minions of Bosk. There's a lot of exploration involved as you're looking around each level, fighting enemies, and collecting items. Some of the basics include activating switches to get to the next part of the level, most, if not all, the levels of the game has numbers labeled for each area you have to go to, 
and a lot of it involves Blasto looking around to find the switches to get to the next area. It starts off fairly simple, and the paths in episodes 1 through 3 are fairly straightforward, but once you get to around episode 4, then that's when it starts getting complex, as you're looking around one big old map, and you basically would have to look around every nook and cranny just to find all these switches, and that is where the maps in the game comes in handy, because each level in the game has these flashing screens on the ground, touch them, and it would unveil a part of the map of where you are. Again, not something you're likely going to use for the first few episodes, but as you get further in the game, then they become really necessary, as some of the levels become so big and expansive that it's very easy to get lost in them. And for that, you would need the map to figure out where you're at now, and where you haven't gone to just yet. Some of the enemies that you come across as you're exploring the game consists of the rather generic looking green aliens, known as the paratroops, as well as the iBots, which, with a relatively self-explanatory name, are these robot eyeballs that shoot lasers at you. That's about the gist of who you'll be coming across most of the time. They might change them up a little bit by fighting these slightly harder versions of the paratroops, where they wear different colors, and harder versions of the iBots, which would be at more darker shades to indicate their level of difficulty. However, as you get further in the game, then you'll encounter other alien types, some that fits in with Blasto's rather humorous comical style, such as in Episode 4, where you encounter the Uranian Nomads, which are these rather redneck-type aliens with the laser equivalent of an old firearm. As you'd expect, they don't take kindly to trespassers on their own property, so watch out! Other enemies that you encounter includes the lesser spotted Zargon Jellybean. And no, I did not make that up, that is literally the name of this alien. And while they may be lesser spotted, as they mostly show up in Episode 4, they also show up in another color formation in one of the later levels, and in tougher form, too. There's also some other rather annoying enemies in this game, but before I get to that, this is probably a good time to talk about the weapons. And the default weapon that you would have throughout the game is the standard 100 tetrawatt Blastomatic which is good for the basic run and shoot. It will kill any type of enemy that you come across, but also, with this being such a basic weapon, it also means that it is the weakest. So, you are gonna wanna upgrade as much as possible. You can upgrade the Blastomatic to what Blasto himself would call a 200 tetrawatt death dealing power up from hell. And you can even upgrade to a 300 tetrawatt as well. Which is the most powerful your Blastomatic can get? Either way, though, your Blastomatic will have unlimited ammo and is good up until you die and have to reset. But while the upgrades to your Blastomatic are good and all, there's also other weapons that you come across, all of which has their own limited ammo. One of them includes the Atom Dicer a 200 ammo gun that allows you to shoot some really fast lasers at some of the enemies. It's especially useful when there's a whole herd of bosses' minions gathering up on you, and the Atom Dicer can shoot up a whole lot of those enemies at once. Other weapons include the Crispy 500 Flame Spitter, where it works as a flamethrower by holding the circle button, but you can shoot a big fireball at them by hitting the circle button. And from there, instant burn! Another fantastic weapon is the Lock and Burn Heat Seek 360, which locks on straight on the enemies and fires at them. And then we have some of the uncommon weapons, like the Nucomatic Atom Scatter 9000. This one only has three ammo, and for good reason, 
because this means instant annihilation for just about any enemy that you come in contact with. This is especially good when you have basically a whole bunch of enemies gaining up on you, and some of your basic weapons still leaves a lot of them left over. So, when in doubt, nuke the little bastards! Yeah! But also, with Blasto's comical style, you have some of the more sillier weapons, like the Xenomatic Instant Alien Generator. This one also has three ammo, and all it does is create pear-shaped aliens. Sounds like the type of thing that wouldn't be a good weapon to use, but it's actually useful for two things. The first and main reason you would even need this weapon is to get past Tiny, the 12 foot tall man eating snarf. This guy can't be defeated until the very end, no matter how many weapons you use against him. And if this guy gets anywhere near you, then crunch! It means instant death for Blasto. But you can use the instant alien generator to be able to get through this big blue bastard. The other reason you'd use the instant alien generator is in moments where you need a certain switch activated, and then you can kill him. But while those other weapons are really nice to have at your disposal, they are all really temporary, and you're mostly using the basic Blastomatic weapon. And once Blasto dies, then your weapon would be downgraded back to the basic 100 tetrawatt blaster. And believe me when I say that you are going to need as much of your weapons upgraded as possible. Because while we may have the standard generic pair troops and floating iBot type of enemies, there's also other enemies that can be just downright irritating. By far, the most annoying enemy you'll come by are these things, the Ground Burst Terrains. They pop out of the ground in certain places where you get really close to them, and once you do, then they'll start shooting out smart bombs that fly all over you, and destroying these turrets are an absolute pain in the ass. The fastest way to kill these ground turrets is by utilizing an upgraded weapon, which most of the time you're not likely going to have. Otherwise, if you're just using the regular Blastomatic, then you have to have it charged up at all times. And even when you're doing it, they take forever to destroy. Way more than they should be. And this is especially a problem when you're at one of the later levels where you're dealing with a whole shit ton of these terrains. Which in turn can lead to the smart bombs being shot at you from all sorts of different directions. Gah! Alright, Blasto, come on. Keep killing them. Keep shooting them. Come on. Let's blow that biatch up. Come on. Let's do this. Yeah! Oh, dear God, look at this. Look at this. There's too many of them. There is too many of these ground terrains. How is this fair? No. No. Come on. Shoot them. Shoot them. Ah! God damn it. But if you think that was annoying, then we also have Boss Elite Guard. Yeah, that is literally the name of these bad guys. Rather generic, but they can't be screwed around, as they are some of the most defensive basic enemies in the entire game. Regular shots of the Blastomatic would deflect and bounce right off, which means that you've got to aim for the head by charging the Blastomatic. Well, it's not as annoying as the ground Tourette's, they are still a pain in the ass to deal with, but there's at least some satisfaction in beating these enemies, as you get to see that sweet head decapitation action. Yeah, Blasto may not have extreme gore, but this type of cartoony violence is pretty sweet to watch. But aside from fighting enemies in this game, another objective you have is rescuing the space babes. In each level, Bosk and his army has enslaved at least a few of the space babes, and they're essentially taken hostage, either trapped inside cages, or from having to fight a mini-boss. They're the game's damsels in distress, basically. 
If you rescue the babes, then you will be rewarded either with health, lives, and even some weapon upgrades. While rescuing every babe isn't a requirement for progressing into the main game, it is necessary when you're reaching for 100% completion. That is, if you choose to. But this also means getting through a lot of the game's mechanics. Because this game ends up being hard as hell. Periodically, as you're playing through the game, then you will come across some save points. And while it is easy to save your game every time you come across one, it's best not to do that. Because once you use up all your lives, then you're only given three continues throughout the whole entire game. So what that means is that you gotta save up your lives and health as much as you can in order to survive. Because if you save at a point where you pretty much have no lives and no continues left, then you're most likely going to have to start the game all the way over at the very beginning. So, if you want a chance at actually being able to complete this game, then you gotta save up and conserve as much of your lives and continues as you can. So, for instance, if you come across a health pill, wait until you're a bit lower on health before you do so. And believe me when I say this, you are gonna need all of the lives you can get, because the game gets very difficult as you proceed. And by that, I mean in some ways, it can get rather unfair and punishing in some aspects, where there's various enemies in which there's way too much enemies. And especially when you get the really annoying ones, like the ground burst turrets. But there's one other aspect about the game that makes the game even more difficult, and this is the first of what is several aspects of where I think this game has not aged particularly well. The aspect that makes Blasto this rather awkward type of game in which developers were still trying to figure out 3D gaming. And that is the controls. When you first start the game and move Blasto around, you'll find that the controls tend to be a little slow and clunky. Some of the platforms that Blasto jumps on tends to be a bit hard to have him get a firm grasp on them. And then, there's the camera controls. If you're using a basic PlayStation controller, then you move the camera by holding the L2 button. And, well, honestly, this is a really awkward camera to use, and not something I'd recommend using. Generally speaking, you're gonna need the PlayStation DualShock Analog Controller in order to have somewhat decent camera controls. Even then though, they are a little bit on the jerky side, but they do get the job done. Either way, the camera controls for the game is generally feels kind of weak when you compare them to other 3D titles like Super Mario 64 which was not only one of the first 3D games to use camera controls, but also utilized it properly, both with the left and right C buttons and the perspective angle from Mario. That type of style would also be further utilized with Spyro the Dragon, where you use the L2 and R2 buttons to move the camera around, as well as the triangle button to look around in Spyro's perspective and also with Banjo-Kazooie, with similar controls by using one of the C buttons to look around. But now, we get into what is probably the worst controls throughout the whole entire game, and that is the underwater portion, which you'll come across once you get to episode 4, and this is another area where I'm coming back to Super Mario 64 for comparison purposes, particularly the inverted controls. Here, you have Mario swim by pressing A on the Nintendo 64 controller. As you're moving Mario through the water, you move the joystick up and down to get Mario to move to whichever surface level you want to go while pressing A while doing so. It's a simple formula, and it works. Blasto sort of uses that formula, 
but it's clear that the way you control Blasto is not very well refined. To start off with, once you are at the very top of the water, Blasto can't just jump right off. Instead, pressing X has Blasto dive underwater, which can be very awkward. If you're aiming to get Blasto to swim back onto the water surface, then pressing X again would have him start swimming underwater. And when he swims underwater, he moves really slow. And the controls feel absolutely stiff, which can especially be a problem when you're coming across all sorts of enemies, such as those pair troops, who now have spears, and the piranhas. Oh boy, those piranhas can be a bit of a problem. As you come close to them, they can pretty much eat you up instantly. And these underwater controls do not help in the matter at all. Because the worst part about it is that at random times, the controls would get rather jerky. Sometimes as you're trying to move forward, Blasto would rotate in the other direction at the most inconvenient of times. It's especially a problem when you're at the level where you have to swim past all those smart bombs. And as you try to swim and proceed past these smart bombs, that's where the underwater controls can really work against you. Not just with rotating Blasto, but also moments where, because this is such a narrow path, you get wall clipping. That goddamn wall clipping. No, do not go in reverse. I don't want you to be doing that. And I get blown up. Perfect. But aside from the underwater controls, you also get to ride on a jetpack. All right. And for this, the best comparison I have for that would be Crash Bandicoot 2. As towards the end of the game, Crash gets to ride on a jetpack. Now, the controls for this are not particularly solid, as pressing up on the D-pad moves him down, while down moves him up. So, in other words, inverted controls. However, pressing X on your controller has Crash moving forward on the jetpack, while pressing circle moves him backwards. Again, these controls are not particularly great. It can get a little bit awkward, which I think might be why Naughty Dog saved that portion of the game towards the end. But even then, they're still way better than Blasto's jetpack controls. Because at least with Crash, controlling him doesn't feel so slow and clumsy. With Blasto, they decided to bring the jetpack towards the middle of the game, and they did try to improve from Crash slightly by having the X button be what makes Blasto move up, and you do move Blasto around with your D-pad, but even maneuvering him around oftentimes feels really flimsy, as there's times where Blasto sort of stays in place. Oh, and then there are areas in the lava that contain useful items like extra lives, health, and weapon upgrades, something that requires the jetpack to obtain. But here's the problem. A lot of times, the jetpack doesn't want to work anytime it wants to, because if you try to go for these items, Blasto would get burned to a crisp before you could even get the jetpack to work. This especially becomes a problem, as you actually need as many lives and health as you can to fight the giant iBot boss. This boss eliminates a lot of your lives, and you pretty much need a good, powerful weapon in order to have a chance to defeat him. Otherwise, this is going to suck away a lot of your lives and health. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a good example of why you need to conserve as much of your lives and health as you can. There's also other areas in the game that had a lot of potential and could have been good had the game used more of it. One example of that is that you get to ride on KFC. Yes, that is literally the name of the chicken that you get to ride on. And while he does serve some potential, unfortunately, it's very underutilized. To give a good comparison, 
Let's look at some other games that use these type of companions, such as, for instance, Yoshi, who appears in most levels in Super Mario World and was a big asset to the game. But let's imagine for a second that that wasn't the case. Imagine if in Super Mario World, Yoshi only appears in one very small minor part in the middle of the game, but he doesn't really do anything useful. He doesn't use his ton to eat up enemies, nor does he jump on them. The only use Yoshi has is just running and jumping. Wouldn't really add anything exciting to the game, right? Well, that basically describes KFC's role in Blasto. He shows up in one minor part during Episode 4, and all he does is run and jump. That's it. He doesn't fly, or peck, or do really anything special. His best use, really, is for jumping over these long, hard-to-reach platforms. But otherwise, there isn't really much of a use for him. And you also can't take him outside of that very small part in Episode 4, where Blasto travels. But, I guess if there's one thing he shares in common with Yoshi, is that you can leave him behind at any time you want. Also, to add to the game's bad controls, is trying to get off of KFC because getting off of him isn't quite as simple as it should be. You would think that it would be a simple button press on your controller, but really, it's a button combo of down and X, and sometimes even doing that doesn't always respond properly. Now, I get that the game's development cycle isn't exactly a smooth one, but I would think they could have at least mapped the option to getting KFC to at least a button press, and that's not an instance where 3D game controls makes a game a bit hard. I mean, Super Mario World perfected that with Yoshi back in 1991, and that was a 2D platformer. How hard would it have been to use one button of the PlayStation controller that may not have been in use to get off KFC? Still, KFC is a character that does have a lot of potential it's just something that could have been utilized more. But this does go along with Blasto's rather comical style, and nothing demonstrates that more than the voice actor that they use, as the voice of Blasto is none other than the late Phil Hartman. You may remember him from such iconic roles like Captain Carl from Pee-wee's Playhouse and Bill McNeil from News Radio. Or you may remember him from when he was a cast member on Saturday Night Live. But if you're like me, then you probably remember him from the characters he would play on The Simpsons, particularly Troy McClure and Lionel Hutz. So, in other words, he's no stranger to voice acting. And if you're a fan of the characters he's played on The Simpsons, then you'll definitely like how he plays as Blasto, as the rather cocky, humorous nature of the character fits well with some of the characters that he's played. Honey, I'm home! Don't even break a sweat. Upsy daisy No more Mr. Night Sky! Let's rock! Ha <laughs> ha! Piece of cake! Bambi, good heavens! You can't wear that in this neighborhood! Another aspect to Blasto's style, aside from the voice of Phil Hartman, is the rather cartoony nature of the game. Blasto took a lot of its inspiration from Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century, which starred Daffy Duck as the hero in space. In many ways, Blasto is a bit reminiscent to Duck Dodgers, not just in terms of its humorous style, but also in its design choice as a lot of the world shown in the Duck Dodgers cartoon shows a lot of those rather narrow pathways, which is something that Blasto used. And some of the design used in space technology was also used in Duck Dodgers. For example, the elevator that is used seems to be based off the teleporter in Duck Dodgers, and even some of the blaster weapons that Duck Dodgers used also seems to have been adapted in some form into Blasto as well. Aside from Duck Dodgers, the game was also made to be reminiscent to the old science fiction film serials from the 30s and 40s, such as Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers. 
Part of this is demonstrated by the fact that each level in the game is listed by episodes to kind of give it that feeling of it being like a serialized film. I mean, hell, there's 13 total in the game, which is about as many episodes as the original Flash Gordon film serials have received. But also, even though there's 13 episodes, the order that you play them in isn't always consistent, as some episodes are actually connected within one episode. So, for instance, once you get to episode 4, and you explore a little bit, then you may end up in episode 5. Great, so then you completed episode 4, right? Nope. Because episodes 5 and 6 are connected within episode 4. So, in other words, after you complete episode 5, then you will go back to episode 4, then find your way to episode 6, so they're all in one level. It's a little confusing. I'm guessing space limitations are a big contributor to this, as well as a bit of how rough of a development cycle Blasto is. How so? Well, for that, we go back to Blasto's development cycle, as this is a very interesting one. Blasto first entered development in 1995, back when the PlayStation was in its first year on the market, and there was a lot of trouble in Paradise all throughout the time the game was being worked on. For one, the game was developed by a rather small development team, with much of the staff being rather inexperienced with game development. That alone makes the project ambitious, but on top of that, this was the fact that they were tasked with the very complicated task of making a 3D game for the PlayStation. Now, keep in mind, this was 1995 we're talking about. Super Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot hasn't even been released during that period. So, in other words, this was when gaming was going through that very awkward transition period between 2D and 3D gaming. Even big-name developers didn't know how to work with 3D gaming, let alone a small development team. Sure, there were genres such as racing and fighting games that helped out the transition to 3D pretty well. I mean, after all, Virtual Fighter did really well for the Saturn during that time. But those were games that had a smoother transition between 2D and 3D. I mean, after all, racing games were already being used in a 3D environment, even as far back as the NES. But as far as platforming titles go, that was still a very rough patch. There were some games that was 3D, but had more of a 2D platforming style. But as far as a full-on 3D action game platformer goes, that was still very early in development. So the pressure of making a 3D platformer was already intensive at the time, but it didn't end there, as on top of all that, this was the team that Sony relied on to make their big mascot for the PlayStation. I'm talking about going up against the likes of Mario and Sonic. Because of this, a bunch of deadlines were imposed onto the development team, leading to more pressure on working on this already demanding 3D platformer, and as a result, the game was met with a ton of delays. But despite all this, a lot of the team that worked on Blasto was very dedicated, and had a lot of passion of getting the product out. Part of that is due to the memory of the game's original producer, Dave Poe, who passed away during development of this game. Dave was somebody that really believed in the potential of Blasto, and it is because of his passion for the game that gave the team the extra motivation to keep his vision for the game alive. Had it not been for the team's dedication to keep Dave's memory alive, this game may not have even seen the light of day. It took a lot of behind-the-scenes fighting to get the game moving, but Blasto would finally be revealed to the public during E3 of 1997. And if you look at early gameplay footage of that compared to the final product, there was still a ton that was fleshed out particularly textures that still weren't applied at this stage in the game, but for the most part, it was relatively close to the completed product, and even after its original reveal, the game still would receive another delay. Blasto would have a release schedule of Fall 1997, 
but that was delayed again to spring of 1998. But by then, the possibility of Blasto becoming the mascot for Sony was pretty much dead in the water. It was already the halfway point of the PlayStation's life cycle, and only a few years before the PlayStation 2 would come out. If anything, Crash Bandicoot had become the unofficial mascot for PlayStation at that point. I say unofficial, as even though it was developed exclusively for PlayStation, the IP was owned entirely by Universal Interactive Studios, who could at any point pull Crash away from Sony and start bringing the franchise to other platforms, which is exactly what they would do after the PlayStation 2, starting with The Wrath of Cortex. As even though that game would be a timed exclusive for the PlayStation 2, it would later be released on the GameCube and Xbox a year later. And also, in a rather ironic twist of fate, in 2022, Microsoft had announced that they are going to be buying out Activision Blizzard. As of the making of this video, the sale had not yet gone through, so it's still currently pending. But if it does happen, then Crash Bandicoot will officially become owned by Microsoft, so it's possible we may soon start seeing an Xbox-exclusive Crash Bandicoot game if this deal fully goes through. But as far as Blasto goes, do I think this would have had a chance at becoming a mascot for PlayStation? I kind of doubt it. While Blasto does seem to have a lot of that appeal, the thing about him is that the game was made more for an older demographic, and while it is true that gaming was becoming more geared towards adult audiences at that point, with M-rated titles like Resident Evil, the thing about a gaming mascot is it needed to have a universal appeal. A character that is suitable for all audiences, and not just older ones. This is an area where Crash Bandicoot checks off those marks. But with Blasto, the game has a lot of adult humor and sexual jokes, to the point that it doesn't exactly come off as mascot friendly. That's not to say that a gaming mascot can't be in any way edgy. I mean, Sonic the Hedgehog was pretty much edgy, in kind of an extreme, early 90s type of way, but it still was family friendly. Blasto just really isn't. But also, it is because of the rather rough development time that Blasto came out in kind of the rough shape that it is. There was plans for a Blasto sequel if the game did well enough. In fact, there's even a part in the credits that states, Coming soon, the further adventures of Blasto, implying that there is more to come featuring the character. But sadly, that never happened. And what is probably the biggest tragic end to Blasto's legacy is the death of Phil Hartman, as on May 28, 1998, just a month after the game's release, Phil Hartman was tragically murdered after being fatally shot by his own wife upon returning home from a night of drinking. The aftermath of his death would lead to several things. For one, out of respect for his legacy, the characters that he played on The Simpsons would end up being retired, likely out of respect for Hartman. But on the other side of the coin, however, Phil Hartman was originally selected to play the role of Captain Zap Brannigan from Futurama, a role that would end up going to Billy West, and, well, if you listen to Zap Brannigan's character, he does have a lot of the characteristics that Phil Hartman brings to some of his own comedy and characters that he brings, particularly that type of cocky style that is brought with some of the characters he played on The Simpsons, and, well, even with Blasto a bit. Ha <laughs> piece of cake. Now, it's been said before that Phil Hartman's death was viewed as the reason why Blasto never got a sequel, as in the same way his Simpsons characters were retired, nah, not making a sequel seems like something that would be done out of respect for Phil. And while that might play a little bit of a role into this, I really don't think that's the core reason. It just wasn't that well received of a game. 
and the sales figures didn't really do enough numbers for Sony to really justify greenlighting a sequel. Phil Hartman's death may have been the franchise's final death nail, but also I gotta ask, if the game actually did end up doing better and actually brought more PlayStations and people's homes, do you really think Sony would have passed on making a sequel to this just because the voice actor is no longer alive? I mean, I wouldn't think so, as at the end of the day, money talks, and Blasto could always be recasted. I mean, Billy West would be a good contender with how well he does with Captain Zap Brannigan. Blasto is a very, very flawed game, and it definitely could have used more fine-tuning, but I would be lying if I said that I didn't enjoy it. Yes, the game can get unfairly difficult at times, in moments where it wasn't exactly necessary. Like, for instance, the amount of ground burst turrets that is in that one area. That can get annoying, but once you actually do fully get through the game, it feels pretty damn satisfying. Part of this could be from my own personal nostalgia for the game, as Blasto was one of the first games I owned for the PlayStation. And, well, that did bring up a lot of good memories for me. But playing this as an adult, I do see a lot of the flaws that this game has. Controls are a bit clunky, with some areas, like the underwater levels, being a bit of a pain to maneuver. But it feels so good to have finally completed the game for the very first time after over 20 years of playing it. And I do think the potential for this game was there, and I think that if the game was able to be polished up a bit more, that they fixed up the controls a bit to be more responsive, fine-tune a lot of the difficulty, and fix some of the bugs, then I think this could have ended up being a heavy hitter for Sony. And I kind of feel bad for the development team of this project not being done the way they wanted it to. I mean, I feel like this game and the development team does deserve another chance. But hey, who knows? Maybe this video will end up sparking new interest in Blasto, to where it ends up leading to high demand for the game being remade for the PlayStation 5. I mean, that would be a great way to give the developers of the game another chance. Though, honestly, I think if anything, this video would probably more likely lead to some people making YouTube videos using voice clips from this game to sync up to Captain Zap Brannigan to see how Phil Hartman would have sounded playing that character. Now, the game may not be for everybody, but it does deserve a fair chance. Just know that the game does have its flaws before going into it. I'm Captain Blasto, protector and hero to women, not master and jailer. Blasto, for the PlayStation 1, receives a score of 6 out of 10. The good thing that I have to say about the game is that the game has a nice cartoonish sort of comical style to it. The weapons that they have are pretty cool, including like some of the zappers and the blasters and all that. And also I think one of the nicest touch to it is the voice actor having Phil Hartman be the voice of Blasto. But the bad things that I have to say about the game is that the controls are not exactly that tight, especially when you get to the underwater levels. The difficulty is a bit inconsistent and can go from being harder to easier in some areas. And also, there are some good elements that have potential but has been largely underutilized. Good example of that is the usage of KFC. If you enjoyed this video, then also be sure to check out Sunday Game Nights. This is a collaborative YouTube channel with myself and a few others, and we play games together. There's co-op team-ups, some single-player playthroughs, and even some multiplayer fun that involves pitting against each other or even screwing each other over in party game madness. New videos are uploaded every Sunday, and there's a lot of fun to have on this channel. Check us out! That's Sunday Game Nights. Link in the description below. Thank you all for watching. Be sure to subscribe to this channel for more content. 
There's reviews, let's plays, and sometimes even live streams that involve the Sunday game nights, and anything else I upload. Give this video a thumbs up and give your thoughts below. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time. Have a good one.